here are my top eight stocks to buy right now, half of which I currently own and half of which I'm still considering investing in. In this video, we'll alternate one stock that I own followed by one stock that I'm researching to keep it interesting as we work our way up to a stock that's increased by 97% in just the last year that may have the potential to double again. And at the end of the video, I'll share every single stock trade that I've made in the past month. So to start out, here is my actual stock portfolio account. We can see how much money I have in here and we can see how much it's gone up over the past six months. So over that time, it's increased by about $24,000. Although if we zoom in a little more to just the last three months, it's gone up around $11,000 in that time. And for transparency, I'll be showing you my actual stock positions as we go through the stocks. Starting with stock number one, SoFi. This fintech stock has been growing like a weed while churning out $98 million in adjusted EBITDA, which is just a fancy word for profit. So here it is in my portfolio. I own 1,900 shares of the company at a value of $12,000. And that means I've made around $900 in the company overall. SoFi is a fintech company. They're really three businesses in one. You have their lending segment, which is where they make most of their money. You have their financial services, which include things like the SoFi app and SoFi money. And you have their technology platform, which is the technology basis that underlines all of the banking that they do. SoFi's goal is to start out being the most consumer focused bank on the planet, using emerging technology to benefit their customers. Then as they learn how to provide better and better services and win over customers from the legacy banks, they'll then use that technology to support other banks that can use their technology platform. And they're seeing some success. Robinhood, which is the biggest investing app in the world, has partnered with SoFi's Galileo technology platform to support their checking and savings account. Meaning SoFi is doing so well that even their competition is using their technology to run their business. But while it's fine if the story sounds good, it's better if the numbers support that story. Well, SoFi has increased their number of products sold by 45% year over year in their most recent quarter. And you can see how this growth rate has absolutely exploded since they became a public company a few years ago. On top of that, they now have 137 million Galileo accounts. These are basically customers who are using their Galileo technology platform for payments processing. And they represent a lot of customers that they can then cross sell their other services to. Because SoFi basically works like a giant sales funnel. They capture customers using services like SoFi Invest and SoFi Money. And then they funnel them down into more valuable areas of the company like personal loans or home loans. And since currently they have 5.6 times more fintech products than lending products, that is a huge mass of customers that SoFi can upsell their much more valuable lending products to. So they have better technology, they have more customers, and they have a better roadmap than the legacy banks. That is why I invest in SoFi. And by the way, if you're not subscribed, consider hitting the subscribe button. We're super close to hitting our goal of 50,000 subscribers by the end of the year. And if everybody watching this video right now, the 80% who aren't subscribed, just hit that button, we could hit it before December 31st. But that's only if everybody watching hits the button right now. Yeah, you. Okay, but SoFi is a relatively new company. But let's now turn our attention to a company who's managed to increase their value by $70 billion in just the last year, making its investors a cool 60% year to date. That company is Intel. Now, when you think Intel, you might not think innovation. Intel is basically an old school computer chips manufacturing company. And while they used to dominate the entire industry, more recently competitors like AMD and Nvidia have taken their market share. And when you look at the company's earnings, things are kind of all over the the place. One year ago, they made revenue of 14 billion, but they lost 600 million on that. Then the next quarter, they lost 2.7 billion. And then after that, they made one and a half billion. And then in the most recent quarter, they only made 300 million. Their net income is swinging up and down by like hundreds of percent every single quarter. So why then is the stock price going up so much? Well, we can see the answer by looking at the company's earnings expectations. The company has beaten earnings expectations by massive amounts in the last three quarters. In this one, they made over 500% more than people thought they were going to make, which is 6x what they thought. And this is the strange thing about investing in these more mature companies. A lot of the times, it's not about what is the newest product that they're producing or how are they going to grow. Instead, the focus is on how much can the company outperform what other people think they're going to do. People at the start of the year had basically ridden Intel off as a company, and then the stock price came surging back as people realized they weren't gonna go down so easy. And with their new 14th generation of Intel core processors, as well as 
moving into the graphics processing space, Intel's stock price may have a road to recovery in front of it. But because the company earnings are kind of all over the place, I'm probably going to wait on buying this stock until they level out a little bit in the future. And if you ever want near real-time updates on when I buy or sell a stock, check out the link in the description for the FinTech Circle. FinTech Circle is the private stock investing group where I post in near real time every single trade that I make in a stock, along with a detailed breakdown of why I either sold or bought it. You also get access to my in the know newsletter, so you don't have to spend all your time reading the financial news. You can just get an immediate brain dump from me to you on whatever's been happening in the market last week and this week, condensed down to just the most important points. And that's not to mention live weekly calls where you can join and ask me any questions you want about investing or really anything in general. Plus my weekly live stream of stock of the week, where I will analyze a company on stream and you can follow along and ask questions as I go. This is one of the fastest ways to figure out my thinking on a stock because you'll actually see it happen live in front of you. Plus you get all these other great perks like live events, free stock training courses, and most importantly of all, a community of like-minded investors who are all working together to build wealth in the long term. Cause we're always smarter together than we are separate. And you can sign up using the link in the description. This basically takes the place of Patreon or other donation sites like that because I actually wanna go above and beyond and provide you way more value than you would get with me just providing stock updates on Patreon. So go ahead and check that out. And now let's move on to the next stock, which is one of the most exciting data and AI companies in the entire world, Snowflake. Snowflake is building the tools that will support the data revolution. A long time ago, when you needed data, you would write it down on stone tablets. Then it moved over into pieces of paper. Then when computers came around, it moved into simple spreadsheets and databases and data warehouses until it finally moved to the cloud. Each of those steps resulted in a 10x improvement in how you could use the data. But Snowflake is inventing the next order of magnitude jump, the data cloud. This makes it so that companies can put their data onto Snowflake and Snowflake can do all the heavy lifting of figuring out how to actually use that data by building tools that everyone can use together. Data is kind of like the new California gold rush of the 1800s. Everybody's trying to get into data and monetize it in some way. But you know who made the most money during the gold rush? It wasn't the people panning for gold. It was the people building the tools for the gold miners. And that is Snowflake's position. They're building the tools for companies to use data and AI. I currently own 60 shares of Snowflake at a value of $9.6,000. And if we look at Snowflake's stock price, we can see just how volatile the stock has been, going down and up and down and back up again. Overall this year to date, it's up 19%, but one swing in either direction could completely make that meaningless. But again, I can tell you any story around why Snowflake is great. What actually matters is what the numbers show, and the numbers are pretty good. In Snowflake's most recent quarter, they reported 37% product revenue growth year over year, with a 142% net retention rate. Here's why that's important. Snowflake having a 142% net retention rate means for every $1 a customer spends this year on their platform, they can expect that same customer to spend $1.42 next year. That's just built-in growth without even marketing to other external customers. And it's incredibly exceptional with Snowflake because Snowflake doesn't sign these big subscription revenue contracts. Instead, they just charge customers based on how much they use the platform. And clearly customers love the platform if they're using more and more of it every year. They now have 78% gross margins and it just shows how as the company scales, they can produce more and more profits. Add on top of that, the fact that they are producing tons of free cash flow, which according to Warren Buffett is more important than profit. And you can see why I invest in this company. Warren Buffett even says the value of a company is based on the cash that you can pull out. And he says that growth investing, investing in rapidly growing companies like Snowflake and value investing are joined at the hip, which is probably why Warren Buffett is one of Snowflake's biggest investors. Now Snowflake is going to post their next quarter of revenue relatively soon. So watch out on the FinTech circle for when I do a breakdown of that. But now let's move on to a company whose stock I don't yet own, but I guarantee you've used their products and may not realize just how much potential this company has in terms of its stock price. Google. Now we all know what Google is. They operate the biggest search engine in the world. They run YouTube, they have Gmail, they have Google Maps. But all of those products make their revenue based on ad revenue. Companies have to pay Google for the right to advertise to their users. And that is a great business model. I don't want to say anything against that. But it's not Google's entire business. One of the fastest growing areas in Google is Google Cloud, where customers can build their services and applications on top of Google's infrastructure at a much lower price than doing it themselves. This is how you can have companies like Netflix that just pop up out of nowhere with their massive video streaming service without needing to build all the infrastructure themselves. They just run on top of a cloud provider. 
future. And right now, the main story of the cloud is AI. We are currently in the middle of the generative AI wars with Microsoft and ChatGPT on one side, Amazon on another, and Google and their AI models on the third side of this triangle. And while a lot of people have declared Microsoft as an early winner due to their $10 billion investment into ChatGPT, people may be counting out Google a little bit too early. Google has now incorporated AI directly into their products like Gmail, letting you use generative AI to respond to your contacts, into their services like Google Maps, making them more immersive and more useful to consumers, and even incorporating it directly into their photo app on their phones. While a lot of people use Microsoft products, Google has one of the largest consumer bases in the entire world, mostly because all their products are free. But this means they can use that base of consumers to practice perfecting their AI on before then selling it to the people who will pay the big bucks, the enterprises running on Google Cloud. And the big play for Google here is going to be Gemini, their competitor with GPT-4, which is supposed to be the AI to end all AIs, where you can talk to it with text, with voice, with images, with video. Any way you want to talk to the AI, you can use that as an input, and then it can generate responses in all those same formats. Now, right now, Google is a little bit behind on their Gemini release. It's not planned to be released until the first quarter of 2024, but when that comes out, we could either see a major jump in Google stock price if it's as good as they say it is, or we could see the stock price drop if it underperforms the multimodal capabilities of apps like ChatGPT. I'm gonna be keeping this on my watch list until then. And remember to stick around until the end to see all the stock trades that I've been making recently. But next, we have another company that I own, which has been my largest investment for a long time. And it's basically John D. Rockefeller's standard oil from the 1900s applied to today, Datadog. Datadog has created over $15 billion in value just over the past year, which has given me a nice boost in my initial investment, where my investment of 146 shares is almost back to zero after we saw a major drop in the stock price back in 2022. And by the way, you'll notice all these stocks have D ratings from Charles Schwab. As far as I can tell, these are completely meaningless. You can see I have stocks that increased by 50% that have a D rating and stocks that have dropped by $3,000 that also have a D rating. And I've had companies where I made a 300% return that had an F rating the entire time that I held them. So personally, I don't put too much stock in the ratings here. Haha, <laughs> stock. British mathematician Clive Humby said back in the 2000s that data is the new oil and Datadog is the provider of that oil. Datadog unites a company's applications, their infrastructure and their security all through what they call a single pane of glass, making it so that companies can take their data from different parts of the organization, put it together and actually use it to generate value for their customers. We're long past the days when just having data was valuable in and of itself. At this point, we make so much data from cloud, from IoT, from connected devices that at this point, the hard part is filtering through that data to find what's actually valuable. And companies that can do this effectively have a huge advantage in the market, especially with an industry like data that is growing so quickly. In their last few quarters, Datadog has increased their revenue by over 25% year over year while making over $2 billion in revenue per year. What you're seeing on screen is just for three months. And perhaps most importantly, in Datadog's most recent quarter, they reported positive net income for the first time ever. Datadog is profitable. And that's probably why we saw the stock price jump basically 25% overnight shortly after they reported earnings. Now, that being said, the fact that Datadog has beaten all of the projected earnings for basically as long as they can remember means that their earnings forecasts aren't going to be that accurate. At the start of the year, Datadog has said that they were going to miss their earnings results for the entire year. Then in their most recent quarter, they outperformed that, which seems to show that leadership doesn't really have a handle on how much demand they're going to have for their products, at least in the short term. And so because of that, I'm probably not going to buy any more Datadog at this point, and I'm just going to hold to see when the economy starts to stabilize. Because at that point, there could be substantial upside for a company that's growing fast like Datadog in a rapidly expanding industry that is also profitable. But next up, we have a little known tech stock that is quietly taking over massive parts of the world using what they're calling a super app, Grab Holdings. Grab Holdings makes an app that you can use for grocery delivery. And it's also an app that you can use for banking. It's also an app where you can get paid for doing services for other people. It's not common in the United States yet, but in much of the world, you have apps like WeChat, which basically act as the single app that people run on their phone that does everything they need. E-commerce, grocery deliveries, checking and savings accounts, it's all there in a single app. And when you think how much companies are willing to pay just to be one of the five apps that most people have on their phones, having one app dominate the market is incredibly valuable. Hence why you have companies like Tencent Holdings, which creates WeChat, which is now worth over 3 trillion Hong Kong dollars. Grab Holdings currently does most of their business in South 
Southeast Asia, although they are trying to expand outside of that into other markets as well. The company is currently absolutely exploding in terms of their growth. They made $615 million in just the last three months, which is an increase of almost 61% year over year, while at the same time improving their negative net income by a massive amount to the point where they could soon be profitable. And even though they aren't profitable, they are producing positive free cash flow, which as I've said before, is more important during an economic downturn. Because when you're in a recession, cash is king. With cash, you can buy back the stock price if it dips. You can invest back into the business. You can go out and buy other competitors. And so having cash while being in a position to grow rapidly puts Grab Holdings in an extremely good spot. The only reason I don't own this stock yet is because the outcome is basically binary. Are they going to be able to break into markets like India, Brazil, Mexico, and maybe the United States? Or are they going to be pushed out by competitors like Brazil's own apps, WeChat, or even apps like Amazon? If they're able to successfully enter one of these larger markets, the stock price potential is basically uncapped. But if they fail to make any headway, we could see the same thing happen to them as have happened to other apps from the region. Longtime viewers might remember this stock, C Limited, that I used to invest in, which I was able to ride to a massive increase in stock price, but then saw the stock price basically collapse after the free money of the early 2020s disappeared. So we'll just have to see which side of this line Grab Holdings ends up on, which then leads us to a stock that is riding one of the biggest investing trends of the next decade, cybersecurity. And that stock is Zscaler. Zscaler offers what's known as zero trust security. If you think of a traditional security model like a castle with a moat, you wanna keep all the bad guys out and keep all the good guys safe on the inside. The problem is if a bad guy gets into your castle, they have free reign to access everything. With Zscaler, every computer, every person, every application on your network has to authenticate anytime they wanna talk to someone else. It's like instead of building a castle around the good guys, you just give each individual armor that they can wear. And why this is important is this is the mode of security that is becoming more and more common as companies move to the cloud, which puts Zscaler in a really good position as more and more companies move to the cloud. And we see more workers connecting with each other remotely over long distances. Zscaler is currently making almost half a billion dollars in revenue per quarter while growing at 43% year over year. And if we look at their net income or their profit, a year ago, it was negative 68 million, then negative 57, negative 46, then negative 30 in their most recent quarter. So while they're not yet profitable, they're moving in the right direction. Add on top of that, the fact that the cloud market in general is growing at 12% every year, and that puts Zscaler in a great spot to continue growing going forward. This is a solid middle-sized position for me. Now there's one more stock on our list, and then after that, I'm going to go over all my stock trades for the last couple months. But for the last one, I'm going to flip the script a little bit. Instead of focusing on a stock that I'm considering buying, I'm going to tell you about one stock that I absolutely hate, Lucid Motors. Now look, Lucid Motors is a really cool company. They focus on developing electric vehicles in the style of a Rivian or a Tesla. And they have some legitimately cool EV tech in their cars and they look great. The problem is their stock price is riding the EV trend that started back in 2020. And unlike some companies, it's never really gotten off the ride. If you were investing in the market at all back in 2020, you probably remember Tesla's stock prices meteoric rise where they increased thousands of percent in just a couple of years. Till at their peak, the company was worth over a trillion dollars and worth more than the entire US auto market combined. But why? Well, Tesla sold EVs before anybody else and we saw EVs getting more and more attention around that time. But on top of that, Tesla was also an energy company selling solar panels that people could put on their roofs. They were also a battery company. They were also a charging delivery station company and they were a software company developing some of the best machine learning technology out there for self-driving cars. Lucid on the other hand, makes cars. For example, if we look at Lucid's ambitions with regards to self-driving, they call it Dream Drive. And this article is from way back in 2020 and it's the most recent one I could find. The way that they describe their self-driving is really just driver assist. It's basically advanced cruise control. And we've had adaptive cruise control where you can stay the same distance from the car in front of you basically since the 1990s. So as innovative as they might be in the EV space, they're not really doing much in the software space. They also don't have their own energy system, even though they do make batteries. They also don't have their own charging network and they don't run a solar panel business as part of the company. Now, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I think that's reasonable for a company of their size. But the reason I'm making this comparison to Tesla is because of the stock price. Lucid Motors stock price, even after dropping 41% this year, values the company at a little over nine and a half billion dollars. But the company is only producing $137 million in revenue and they're losing $600 million in income every year. This means they have a price to sales ratio of six 
69. Let's then compare that to Tesla. Tesla stock is actually up 117% year to date to $735 billion for the company, but their revenue is also $23.35 billion and they are profitable, producing nearly $2 billion in profit. This gives Tesla a price to sales ratio of 31. This means that despite Lucid Motors having no self-driving, no solar panel company, no charging network, and not the same level of battery technology as Tesla, they are valued at twice as much as Tesla per dollar of revenue they bring in. I just don't buy that this company is worth that much and it smells like speculation and hype to me. Now, lastly, I promised that I would share all my recent stock trades with you. So here they are. So in August, I sold 90 shares of Datadog to bring down my total exposure to that company after their growth rate started to slow. I also sold 70 shares of Cloudflare and bought 70 shares of Monday.com in exchange. After that, I sold around 50% of my shares in Bill.com after I wasn't super impressed with that company's earnings. And I also sold 50 shares in Snowflake after their revenue growth rate slowed in the end of August. More recently in September, I sold all of my shares in Sentinel One after I did a breakdown comparing them to CrowdStrike. And then I put most of that remaining money back into CrowdStrike. I also bought into a new company called Clavio, which I spelled wrong right here. And then my most recent trade and my only trade of the last month, I sold 40 shares that I had recently picked up in Accenture. This was mostly based on headwinds I saw in Accenture and the consulting market in general. But if you remember FinTech Circle, you can read my full explanation there. Don't forget to subscribe to help us hit our goal of 50,000 subscribers before the end of the year, and I'll see you next time.